I hear two things very often, which is like, uh, it's too far away to worry about. Come back when it's like actually, you know, doing dangerous stuff. And then the other one is like, it's too late. You can't stop it now. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to the podcast, your podcast, where we attempt to apply real smarts to technology developments that could quite possibly bring a flourishing future or a robot takeover. It's presently unclear. Yep, you're right. We're talking about AI development and all the new realities that AI could bring about depending on how we as Earthlings choose to develop it. But before we go down that rabbit hole, Let's do the podcast details. I'm your host, Lisa Ann Pinkerton. My business is Technica Communications, and this podcast and women in clean tech and sustainability are my hobbies. Thank you for being a listener of the show. And if you're feeling generous, uh, please give us a review. If you've listened to more than three episodes, you most likely are enjoying what you're hearing. So please give us some stars and help other people find us, and feel confident in listening to an episode or two so we can spread the word. Also, if you're feeling financially generous, you can become a Patreon member and help support the podcast and production costs that are related to putting on this show. Or you don't have to do any of that stuff because if you know me by now, you know that I appreciate you just as you are. AI has come a long way since Alan Turing first spoke of this concept in 1947 London. Since then, it's played checkers in the 1950s, read postage addresses that were handwritten, and of course, ChatGBT, among many, 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 many other developments. And even though it seems like AI is everywhere and every company is adopting AI, it's still in its nascent stages. You can experience these nascent stages when you go to ChatGBT and you put on a prompt and it doesn't give you anything remotely useful. Or those chatbots that you, you engage with knowing that within 30 seconds to a minute, you're going to be so annoyed with it, you're going to be typing human, human, I need to speak to a human operator in like all caps and want to throw your computer across the room. Or maybe that's, maybe that's just me. Uh, but anyway, if you're someone who has spent a lot of time around startups uh, or in Silicon Valley like me, you, you hear a lot, run fast and break things. Um, and that, that's fine for a small piece of software or a device. But when we're talking about artificial intelligence, some very smart people uh, have uh, attempted to raise the warning flag. Um, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, uh, even Sundar Pichai, uh, the CEO of Google. And, and what they're pointing out is that, you know, AI development is going to move incredibly fast. And then you compare that to the speed of government and other organizations to adapt and apply the guardrails necessary to protect society and specifically democracy. And you have a mismatch here. So uh, we engaged someone who had some real AI research credentials, uh, who wasn't just a talking head, who could give us some foundational knowledge about where we are today with AI and what's coming in the future and what we can look for and protect ourselves against. And we want to thank the Center for AI Safety in uh, Northern California, the San Francisco Bay Area, for helping us find this young gentleman. His name is David Kruger, and he's the assistant professor at the University of Cambridge and a member of Cambridge's Computational and Biological Learning Lab and Machine Learning Group. My research focuses on deep learning, AI alignment, AI safety, and whatever we can do to prevent the chance that AI leads to human extinction. Yes, no, none of us want that. So thank you for the work that you're doing on that research. Uh, I know our listeners have a cursory understanding of AI. Uh, many have heard the terms like narrow AI or generative AI, and um, which is actually what ChatGTP is, I think. So, and sometimes, you know, this concept of self-aware AI. Uh, and, you know, some of us who've seen the Terminator and Matrix movies too much uh, have a certain apprehension about, about that. So before we get into all that, what are the types of AI and what do they do? Yeah, so like if you're taking a machine learning 101 course, uh, usually they will tell you there's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. 
Um, and this is like a decent starting place, but in fact, there's things beyond these three. And uh, but just to say really quickly, supervised learning is like you tell the answer what you tell the the machine what the right answer is, and then it learns to copy that. Um, and then unsupervised learning is you don't really tell it what the right answer is. You just like show it the problem and somehow it learns something from that. Um, or maybe you show it like a whole book that includes some questions and some answers and some problems and their solutions, and it has to sort of make sense of it. And that's the one that's driving things like ChatGPT primarily. Um, the last one is reinforcement learning. This is like trial and, and error learning where the machine makes a guess and then you tell it how good that guess was. So in supervised learning, you tell it the right answer. In reinforcement learning, it has to guess the right answer essentially. Um, and you don't tell it what, you know, you don't correct it. You just say that was pretty good or that was bad. Um, and that's also involved in, you know, how they train these large language models like ChatGPT, um, because after you do this unsupervised learning on all of the, you know, all the text data you can get your hands on, essentially, then you do some reinforcement learning to actually try and get the system to behave, you know, more like a helpful assistant or whatever. Um, so that's like one way of dividing it up. The, the terms you used were like um, narrow AI, generative AI, I think self-aware AI, and then people also talk about like general versus narrow AI and like human level or superhuman AI or super intelligence. So yeah, basically generative AI just means that instead of, you know, making some prediction that's like maybe a yes or no answer, it's like the, the answer that the system gives you might be a whole block of text or like an image or something. So it's generating something. You know, it's like artificial creativity basically is what I would like to call it. Um, you know, whether or not we want to say these machines are like really creative or not. And yeah, the, the most important distinctions here, I think, are like narrow versus general. So narrow AI is like basically all AI in the in history was always, you know, solving one particular task, like classifying images or like playing a particular game like Go or whatever. And there's been like a little bit of movement towards more general systems that can like play, you know, 10 different games or 100 different games, but it's still just like playing a bunch of video games or board games or whatever. Um, but general AI is like moving way far on that spectrum to things that actually can do all the sort of things that humans can do, right? So humans are sort of taken as a classic, you know, the, the archetypical example of a general AI is a human being. Um, yeah, and then, so then we get to like human level AI. So you could have something that's very general, but still is not very good at any of those things. Um, and so there's sort of two, you know, axes here. One is like how general, how many different things can the AI do? And then how good is it on, at aver on average at those things? Um, yeah, and so, you know, human human level AI or like artificial general intelligence, as it's sometimes called, is in my definition anyway, it's a very controversial term. It's when you have the AI that can do all the things human humans can do and can do them all as well as a human can. Um, and then the question is like, is it going to stop there or is it going to get even better than humans at doing these things? And that's what we've seen in these narrow domains is usually once we get to human level, we get superhuman shortly after that. And so I do expect that's probably, you know, the end game of all this is that we have AI systems that are as general as people, but... Um, smarter kind of across the board, and that would be like super intelligence, as it's sometimes called, or superhuman AI. To wrap it up, very different from what we have today in a way, but you can start to see that we're, we might be making progress towards it with these like chatbots that seem like they can do sort of arbitrary, handle arbitrary text queries reasonably well. Yeah, and those chatbots have had some some successes and, and some, some failures as well when the AI kind of went down a, a dark path, if you will, and we'll get to some of that later on. Uh, but I, I want to ask you, a lot of times people feel concern about AI, like you said, superhuman intelligence, right? So then the human starts to feel diminished and maybe AI will take their jobs eventually. How do you envision this collaboration between humans and AI evolving in the future? What roles might be played in different domains? What, what do you think we could expect? Yeah, so I think the future is always really hard to predict. Um, my prediction is that AI is going to arrive um, too quickly and become too smart too fast so humans won't retain control over it and then we will very quickly find ourselves in a world that is um, really run by AI systems that are um, not doing what we want, doing things that might somehow resemble what we want but also might be completely different um, and so that seems like a really bad position to be in as humanity. I think it's quite likely to lead to human extinction um, in short order. If that doesn't happen, um, or if that takes longer to happen, then I think we will see a period where human there is some complementarity between what humans can do and what AIs can do. So, like even right now, um, we could have an AI system that was, you know, smarter than people in every sense of like having the intellectual capacities or capabilities, um, but it wouldn't necessarily like we haven't solved like robotics, so we we don't know how to make 
hardware that is as good as the human body in some ways. So you could already imagine a future where like human beings are useful because of our ability to manipulate physical matter and like our fine dexterity and stuff like this. Um, but AI is where all of the real decision making and cognitive firepower lies. Um, and like, you know, even going a little bit more hopeful, right? Like we can, we can imagine a world where, um, AI sort of, sort of the, you know, luxury, uh, communism idea where the AI can do everything for us and is in fact doing pretty much everything for us, except for the stuff that we want to do or the stuff that we want other people to do. And so then you could have this more sort of optimistic world where, um, yeah, where, where people's primary role is sort of interpersonal, um, you know, providing care and, and help and, and, you know, entertainment to each other. Yeah. That flows right naturally right into my next question, which is you and I got in contact through the Center of AI Safety, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. Bay Area. Yeah. Um, and they released a statement saying that um, that we should be prioritizing um, AI development alongside other uh, potential risk extinction events like pandemics or nuclear war. Uh, and several other organizations and tech celebrities, all kinds of people have come out saying, hey, we need to be more responsible about this before AI just runs away from us in terms of development. So what are some of these scenarios that most concern you? Yeah, um, so just to like be, you know, 100% clear. So like the, the statement was saying, uh, mitigating the risk of human extinction from AI um, is, is the thing that we need to prioritize along, alongside those. So like, you know, maybe maybe like changing the way that we're developing AI or even not developing certain kinds of AI systems, like maybe more intelligent or more powerful ones than the ones we already have are the sort of things that might involve that I think it's likely to involve. Yeah, in terms of the kind of risk scenarios, so I sort of, you know, painted this picture where we have AI systems that are broadly superhuman sort of across the board. And I think just in the way that we currently organize society and, um, you know, politics and the economy and all of this, I don't think it's very robust to, to this kind of, um, a, you know, completely changed world. So I think that we could see AI systems that have those kinds of capabilities taking people's jobs, like you mentioned, but also um, really being incredibly effective in terms of just managing society overall and even manipulating people and sort of controlling, you know, um, politics or whatever other social, you know, endeavors uh, it it, uh, it happens to be involved in. And so that could, you know, that, that obviously should be a major concern, I think, for anybody who's thinking about that kind of a future. Um, yeah, uh, other risks, I think the, the main risk that I think about is one where AI is, you know, completely out of human control. Um, so roughly, I think a good analogy for this kind of a situation is like having another species or even like alien species that arrives. Um, and I think in that case, it's really, I mean, I think the main thing is to try and avoid that or like not go there before we're ready. Um, unfortunately, I think we're on a, a path towards, you know, just building smarter and smarter systems as fast as we can and deploying them everywhere we think we can make quick money. Um, so yeah, so I, I think this could happen like very quickly, potentially, um, if uh, AI continues to increase at this rate of progress and sort of increasing rate of progress, you have this idea that AI systems can, at some point, once they're smart enough um, in the right ways, they can start doing AI research, both in terms of developing better algorithms, developing better hardware, um, just figuring out how to deploy the AI in different contexts. Um, and I think at that point, you could see like a, a very quick uh, increase in AI capabilities and intelligence. And so we could lose control quite quickly. It could also happen more slowly if um, maybe if we are being a little bit more careful about how we deploy the technology and we have some safeguards and some rules about, you know, when and how you're supposed to deploy it. Um, but I think sort of the economic pressure is still there to replace human decision making um, pretty much everywhere with AI once it gets smart enough. So we somehow need to that's not always going to be the best, I you know, the the best outcome for humans, though, right? They call that proxy gaming yeah, as one of the yeah. risks. Yeah, you totally. Know? Yeah. AI, AI, you know, comes up with these novel things and solutions, but they're at the expense of humanity or society. Yeah. So, like right now, we sort of have a lot of powerful optimizers pointed at proxies like GDP or like quarterly earnings or like you know admissions into the top you know places, um, and we see that that leads to a lot of uh, you know, antisocial, harmful behavior sometimes where people are really focused on, you know, winning these competitions over, um, over these sort of proxy objectives. And I think AI, at the very least, we should expect it to like increase that competition and exacerbate these issues. It might also help us find solutions to these kinds of issues, like better ways of cooperating. 
Um, but I think that's kind of, yeah, speculative. And I like to emphasize that, like, you know, there's all, there's all sorts of ways that things can go well, but like we need to do work and actually like solve problems in order to make, to realize those kinds of futures in my mind. There's all kinds of ways things could go well and go wrong. And it's important for us to be, you know, intentional about what we're doing here. Yeah. So, you know, risks to the, the information ecosystem, to our social, um, mechanisms of, you know, making decisions and holding people accountable, um, you know, another way I like to think about it is like, you know, in the future, AI could make it so that it's almost like trivially easy to hire like a team of, you know, 100 private investigators to follow you around and try and figure out everything about you, right? Um, so that's like, it might have a, a major risk to privacy and any institutions that we have that rely on some some assumption of privacy. Um, yeah, and we, we don't really have, I think, a good sense of what the upper limit is in terms of how manipulable people are, how easy it is to manipulate people when you have a high level of, you know, knowledge about them and you just have really good, you know, understanding of human psychology and stuff like that. So some people think that it's going to be impossible to stop AIs from sort of, you know, have it effectively being puppet masters of humans. So even if they were completely confined in software and we only interacted with them like, you know, like a, like a chatbot or something, it could still just somehow get people to do whatever it wanted. If it, if it, you know, if it wanted things, um, I think the jury's still out on that, but I think it's, it's plausible that it will have an extremely high level, uh, ability to manipulate people. I mean, we, we've seen what just normal people can do in terms of manipulating each other sometimes. Um, yeah. Well, you know, human manipulation is an eon long activity that humans have engaged with. So I think the, uh, our capacity of being manipulated is, it will always be there. Obviously, the more we are educated about how our brains can be manipulated and how we might be susceptible to certain things, I think the better off people are uh, in resisting that because they can identify when that's happening ahead of time. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to do on that front. So I, I do expect there'll be like some future manipulation technologies. I mean, honestly, okay. Some, some current apps are even already a bit like this, where it's just like, it is like a drug. It's like the only winning move is not to play, you know, like, or, or you're taking a risk that you will just get incredibly addicted and, and spend a ton of, ton of your time interacting with that thing. If you try it like at all ever. So the only, yeah. Um, I guess one other risk I, I feel like I should mention that I haven't so far um, is autonomous weapons. So I think this is, people often are like, well, you know, how is it going to actually kill people like in the real world? And I think, you know, the fact is that we tried uh, recently, and by we, I mean people in humanity, a lot of people tried pretty hard to get some sort of ban on lethal autonomous weapons, killer robots. And it was like a complete non-starter, basically. Um, and so with the current state of geopolitics, where we have something like international anarchy, it's very difficult to prevent, you know, uh, sort of the unrestricted use of AI in the military, which I think will mean, um, you know, uh, taking humans out of the loop. So in general, in the military, whoever can sort of um, observe, orient, DA, there's something called OODA loop, which basically means, you know, uh, figure out what's going on and respond to it. And doing that faster makes you, it makes a huge difference. You know, if you're in like a dog fight, uh, with your jet and you have to ask a human, like which way to turn in order to not get hit by your enemy, um, that's obviously not gonna, not gonna go well. Um, so yeah, I think the, that's somewhere where I think it's just kind of, kind of clear that we are on course to build more powerful and more autonomous AI weapons. Um, and that's just a very disturbing prospect because at the end of the day, these are things that are designed to kill people and, um, are designed to make, you know, will, will be probably designed more and more to make very split second decisions, um, with incredibly dangerous weapons, um, and with a huge risk of escalation. So, the, the underlying dynamic here is competition, like un, unrestrained competition, um, which could, you know, which, which will lead to similar dynamics in other domains where people want to deploy AI systems that have more autonomy, that can react faster, that don't have as much human oversight, aren't as well understood, aren't as well tested, um, just because they're going to be, provide a huge competitive advantage in the short term, at least. So, so what do we do then as a society? How do we foster a more responsible development of AI? Yeah. Um, very tough question. I, I, I think we have our work cut out for us, as I've mentioned. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot most recently is like, 
what can you do in terms of immediate policy and technical work that can help support that policy, either by showing, hey, this is actually a really dangerous way to build a system, so we need to do something to regulate that, or um, by showing, you know, okay, so we want to impose this rule, but we don't know how to do it um, in a way that doesn't come with huge, you know, infringements on privacy. So can we, you know, can we, for instance, audit a system and show that it meets some criteria without having to know everything about that system? Um, and that's something that I think would, uh, could be pretty useful here because then you could, you know, if you had some tests that you wanted to run to see if a system was, was safe or was dangerous, you could maybe run those without, um, you know, the, the developers of that system being worried that you were going to steal it from them. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about, like, we have international treaties, like, you know, non-proliferation treaty, uh, for, for nuclear weapons. And, um, there's been some, some global alignment around stem cell research in the past. Do you think that we could achieve something similar on a global scale with AI? Yeah, in principle, I don't see why not. Um, I think there's a couple barriers. I think the two main barriers are probably uh, a lack of awareness and concern about the issues with more advanced AI. And then the other is just the difficulty of coordinating, you know, geopolitical rivals, like, for instance, the US and China, um, and figuring out, you know, what sort of compromise could be reached there. So I, I'm very optimistic, actually, um, that we will see more and more people uh, coming to understand and care about this issue and being like very seriously concerned that we are, you know, on this track to build AI that could wipe us all out in like a decade. Um, I think that's just going to become more and more clear to more and more people. Um, and yeah, so that just leaves maybe these sort of geopolitical issues. At the end of the day, I, my main hope, I think, is that um, people can like individual people can actually set aside, you know, their, their petty differences and come together and be like, no, this is actually really important. We need to find some solution. And then we, you know, once we're all on the same page, I think we probably can come up with something. What's the danger of um, some nation state kind of going rogue with their AI development against the uh, advice of others? Yeah, it really depends. So I think um, right now it's, uh, it's a little bit unclear where we're at in terms of like how easy it is to build one of these systems. I think there'll be, that'll become a lot clearer in the next, like within the next year. Um, although there's also, you know, another generation of systems that will be trained that like GPT five essentially, um, could, could be out in like another year's time or something. Um, yeah, so like there's one world where the the front runners right now, which is basically OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, um, Google DeepMind, just maintain that lead, and then others systems are just not that powerful, and that means we don't really have to worry about them geopolitically. On the other hand, um, it does seem like there's a risk here of sort of just going down a pathway towards incre incrementally more and more sort of dystopian surveillance state stuff in order to. Um, prevent, you know, the growing number of actors who have the potential to destroy the world from actually doing it. Um, and so, you know, it all just comes back to this coordination problem at the end of the day, I think, which is not just about like coordinating between national governments, but it's really about how do we make better collective decision making, pro uh, collective decisions as groups at every level of, you know, like from a few people to cities to, you know, companies to nations to internationally. Um, and I think this is actually just like a fundamental problem that plausibly has a really good solution that we just haven't found or implemented yet. Um, so I, I am optimistic that we can do a much better job at that sort of thing. This is all really fascinating. Uh, I really want to ask you about this concept of AI potentially achieving self-awareness or some kind of consciousness. How... How realistic do you think this is given the current trajectory of AI and based on everything you've been saying? Sounds like it's more plausible than, than not, but I'm curious to know from your, with your expertise, uh, what the possibility is here. Let's see. Um, I think I'll start by just saying like people mean different things by consciousness or self-awareness. It's, um, it's a, it's a very contested and debated term. Um, I think the most important thing is that uh, 
I think, from my point of view, consciousness is probably not necessary for intelligence, even superhuman intelligence. And so I think this question of whether or not the system is conscious or self-aware can be dealt with entirely separately from this question of if this system poses a risk and an existential risk, a risk of, of human extinction. Um, so having said that, um, I think some people think of consciousness as, you know, a certain type of software uh, architecture, um, like having to do maybe with some sort of self-reference. Uh, I think a lot of philosophers following David Chalmers think of the hard problem of consciousness, which is like, why do we actually have any sort of experiences, subjective experiences whatsoever? Um, so you can imagine that, you know, when somebody else, um, you know, says, oh yeah, that's, that is a beautiful tree or sunset or ouch, that hurt. They're just saying that and they don't actually, you know, none of the same stuff that is presumably happening for you when you see these things and feel these things is actually happening for them. They're just a philosophical zombie is the term. Um, so I think that is actually a really interesting and important question is the nature of subjective experience, we can call it. Um, and I think the reason it's important is because ethically, I think if uh, someone or something is suffering, having a really bad time, that's important. That's not something that we should ignore. We should try and prevent that. Um, and so the main, the main issue around AI consciousness I see is that we don't have anything like an established science of consciousness that could tell us if AI systems are conscious in the sense of having experiences, which makes them have moral significance in my mind anyways. Um, and so that means that we will be uh, faced with a choice as AI systems appear smarter and smarter and maybe even claim that they are conscious, right? So already it's very easy to write a program that says, I am conscious. You can just say like print conscious but you know if you talk to gpt or these other systems as as you know no, no like blake lemoine did um they will s sometimes say they're conscious um sort of more spontaneously right and so if you have systems that that are that clearly are very intelligent that are claiming they're conscious then there'll be a great temptation to say oh these things have moral significance we should give them rights we shouldn't be allowed to misuse them and that might be the right call. Um, on the other hand, if they're not actually conscious, then giving them rights might um, actually lead to uh, conflicts with the rights of humans. So if we give them property rights, we might find that they end up owning everything and we you know, uh, have, have no resources left to live, right? That's, that's the sort of thing that could happen if you give AI property rights um, and start to treat it as, as you know, an entity with moral significance. On the other hand, if you don't, if you just say, well, of course, it's just a machine, it's just a glorified toaster, no consciousness there, we can do whatever we want with it, um, then that, if you're wrong there, that can also lead to uh, atrocities, right? Um, so if the system is actually suffering and people think that it really has no moral value whatsoever, then, you know, we should expect to see things like at least as bad as what we've seen with factory farming, where I think people do have some intuition that this might be another, you know, conscious being. But I think a lot of people, a machine just clearly doesn't have any consciousness, has no moral worth. Um, but I think that that's, we don't actually know that that's the case. And so our ignorance here leaves us in this very tricky situation where we're kind of damned if we do, damned if we don't. We can't treat these things as if they have the same rights as people um, without risking that we sacrifice the rights of people. We can't treat them as, as machines that have no moral standing um, or else we risk abusing them and committing moral atrocities. Um, so I think this is kind of an overlooked argument for why we should not be developing this kind of technology right now. So there's the risk to humans, right, which is obvious and pretty, you know, uh, if people believe that, then I think it's most people agree that that's worth uh, worth Preventing. trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not everyone, to be clear, not everyone, um, <laughs> but uh, but most people um yeah, but but there's also the risk to the AI, which is, it sounds maybe a little bit uh, fanciful or far fetched, but you know, I I do think it's you know uh, a very important issue that we just have to grapple with one way or another. So or or you know we we take our time, we don't build these things until we feel like we actually understand what we're doing, which is my preferred future. Yeah, but we all know humans are competitive, and somebody's going to keep building it, right? That's kind of goes against human nature. So I can see. There's, it's like a multi-layered conundrum, oh, this AI development. 
I do think it's more a, a, a matter about our current like social and economic system than human nature, just for what it's worth. I mean, I think throughout most of human history, people were competitive, but they weren't like, you know, competing to, um, yeah, acquire capital and like, you know, they, we didn't have the same kind of like innovation and, and economy that we have right now, which, you know, obviously has brought many tremendous benefits, but also, um, it doesn't seem to be something that we actually have the ability to, you know, to grapple with and control and switch off or redirect when it's doing something very dangerous, like pushing for the development of more advanced technology that could endanger our existence. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have seen some successes, though, even there, like regulating other technologies like human cloning and like very specific kind of environmental pollutants and like some success with non-proliferation, certainly not um, that much. But, you know, right now we're not in we're, we're in a, a situation. I think I like to make this analogy. Where it's, it's like nuclear weapons, except nobody has actually built a nuclear weapon yet. So if if we could not build those things, then uh, I think we could actually um have a much better world and have a world where people take very seriously the prospect of somebody building it. Whereas now, you know, with like Iran making some movement towards de developing a, more of a nuclear program, that was a big deal, but it was like sort of ultimately something that the world was decided it was sort of okay with for the time being, um, despite being concerned about proliferation. I really like what you're saying about um, maybe it's not, uh, human nature as much as our current economic or societal, how we've organized ourselves economically and socially. And then I think about climate change and um, think about uh, people who want to sort of evolve out of capitalism into something else that maybe isn't also socialism or communism, something different. And it seems like these, these three things are kind of converging around the same time period. Um we need to change. We need to change how we interact with our environment and 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 the carbon emissions. Some of that is is motivated through economics, and then we have AI here also being motivated through current economic and social um, structures. And it, it's philosophically, it, it's interesting to me that all this stuff seems to be moving in a similar direction. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up climate change. I think it's a great analogy for like the situation with AI. Um, it's, I always like to bring it up as a comparison point. Cause I think, you know, there we had decades of really like scientific consensus to work with and it still wasn't enough. Um, and so I think it sort of gives a sense of the urgency that we have with AI where, uh, a lot of people will, you know, actually a lot of, uh, I hear two things very often when I talk or, or tweet about this, which is like, uh, it's too far away to worry about our system. Like, these LLMs aren't super intelligent. Come on, come back when it's like actually, you know, doing dangerous stuff. And then the other one is like, it's too late. You can't stop it now. It's already, you know, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. People are never going to stop. Um, and these are like, you know, exact opposites in a way. It's like one is saying it's too late. The other say it's too early. And I think, you know, I think it is, it's not too late, but it's like we are behind, um, behind schedule. So like, we can expect once we have that scientific consensus, right, which I, I think we basically will get there, um, or, you know, I'll be very happy if, if it turns out not, uh, and, <laughs> and people are convinced that this isn't an issue. Um, but once we get it, you know, it, it could be decades before we have effective means of actually, you know, taking the political steps needed to, to address the problem. So the idea that it's like too early to worry just seems totally, totally wrong to me. Oh, Earthlings, AI does really feel like a Pandora's box, doesn't it? With both good and bad potential to come out of it, that bad stuff really is bad. Human extinction, robotic takeover. I mean, I kind of went into this conversation feeling like a lot of that stuff was kind of hype, but I've come to a deeper understanding and greater respect for those potential futures. And uh, I want to thank David for his insights there. I also kind of thought we had a lot more time and maybe we don't. So that's certainly disconcerting. And we've done such a great job with climate change and preparing for that. I, I'm at this point feeling a little more than nervous about what AI may bring. But, you know, this isn't the last episode that we're going to have exploring this topic. And I 
um, certain that we can find some positive uses for AI as well as some of the dire predictions. So this isn't the last episode we're going to have on this subject. We're going to explore it more fully. And, um, and please send us your questions and your concerns, and we'll see how we can explore those topics in future episodes. Like, how do we encourage nation states to ensure AI development is going to be done responsibly within their borders. This this concept of international anarchy that David coined, which I had never thought of before, and I think is actually quite apt, uh, that concerns me because, you know, what's stopping some country from having incredibly lax AI development rules and then all the companies just move their operations there so that they can develop however they like? Or... How do we ensure that um, the right guardrails are put in place and they're put in place quickly? I often don't think of, of, of my government as, as being very technically savvy. So how do we ensure that we do we put in the right guardrails? You need some technical expertise for that. So these are these are some things we're going to explore. And, and so send us your, your thoughts as well. I want to hear from you. Go to social media, DM us and or send us an email. Uh, you can go to our website, earthlingspodcast.com, and we'll read your correspondence and listen to your suggestions. Uh, until then, may you find prosperity on this beautiful blue-green space flower we call home. And may you make smarter predictions and smarter decisions than ChatGPT can.